This week, we give our driving impressions on the 2021 Jeep Wrangler 4xe, share the latest news on the Chevrolet Bolt battery fire recall, and does a used Nissan Leaf make sense for a teen driver? That and more, next on Talking Cars. Hi, and welcome back. I'm Mike Quincy. I'm Ryan Pivlikowski. And I'm Mike Monticello. So as super producer Dave Abrams likes to tell me, uh, a lot of Talking Cars uh, followers, enthusiasts, really love when we talk about electric cars. And one electric car in particular is the Chevrolet Bolt, which is in the news this week. And thankfully, we have Mike Monticello on hand to give us uh, the, the lowdown of what's going on with the Bolt. Mike, take it away. Yeah, well, unfortunately, Quince, the news isn't good. Uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, uh, warns that owners of 2017 to 2019 Chevrolet Bolts, uh, these are EVs, should park their cars outside and away from homes or other structures because of a fire risk. And owners have also been instructed not to charge their cars overnight. Keep in mind, this comes on the heels of, you know, eight months uh, previous, uh, Chevrolet recalled 51,000 of these bolts uh, because the battery packs could catch fire. And also keep in mind, we have found out that just because if you had that previous recall done, that doesn't necessarily mean that your bolt is free and clear uh, from this risk. There have been, uh, Chevrolet is aware of two vehicles that caught fire after the recall uh, was done. So, you know, you do need to be very careful about this. Also want to just keep in mind that uh, from the 2020 model year forward, the Bolt used a different battery. So those are not involved in this uh, fire risk. And the, the brand new you know, 2022 Bolt and Bolt EUV uh, are also not part of this recall. GM does say if people are having trouble charging them during the day, you know, because of this warning to not charge them at night, they should call their Chevy dealer and ask for a loaner. But uh, GM uh, told us that the alternative transportation might be available, but they didn't promise anything specific. So this is, is not a good thing. It's kind of disappointing. But hopefully uh, Chevrolet says they're working very hard to get this uh, resolved very quickly. So since we recorded this episode, we have some late breaking news regarding the Bolt. Based on reporting from CR's own Keith Barry on the morning of Friday, July 23rd, GM announced that there will be a formal recall of the Bolt to address the battery fire issues and will be replacing the batteries on bolts free of charge. In addition, GM shared on their website some advice for owners to prevent a fire. And we wanna share these tips because they are important. So customers should, whether or not they receive their current software update, return their vehicles to the 90% state of charge limitation using Hilltop Reserve Mode, and that's for 2017 to 2018 model years or target charge levels for the 2019 models. If you're unable to make these changes or do not feel comfortable making them, GM is asking owners to visit their dealer to have these adjustments made. They're also asking customers to charge their Bolt after each use and avoid depleting their battery below about 70 miles of remaining range when possible. These are big and important changes we want to make sure that all 2017 to 2019 Bolt owners are aware of and heed this advice. Now, back to the show. But in keeping with that electric electrification theme, uh, the car of the week, which is we're going to jump right into right now, is the Jeep Wrangler 4xe. We rented a Rubicon model uh, from, from Chrysler. Uh, for those not uh, familiar with this new Wrangler, it is a plug-in hybrid. It's powered by a turbocharged 2-liter four-cylinder engine augmented by an electric drive. It produces 375 horsepower and 470 pounds-feet of torque. Uh, the company claims uh, the 4 4xe delivers 21 miles of all electric driving, and the EPA says the 4xe gets 49 miles per gallon equivalent. Now, um, we all have driven many, many versions of Wranglers, including the Gladiator pickup truck. Uh, uh, the Wrangler undoubtedly is cool. It is one of the you know highest rated uh, vehicles in Consumer Reports surveys for owner satisfaction. And uh, Mr. Monticello, you spent some time in the Wrangler, especially off-road, which is really how it's in its element. Um, let us know what you think so far. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's kind of an interesting vehicle. I mean, being a plug-in hybrid uh, with the different uh, the different modes that you can do. You know, they have three different like EV modes: hybrid, electric, and e-save. And you can 
you know, one of the modes you can basically save the battery for use for later. And when we talked to the Jeep folks about this, they said, you know, one of the benefits of that is um, is so that when you get to where you want to do your off roading and keep in mind, uh, you know, s studies show data shows that Jeep owners are, you know, one of the highest groups of owners that actually take their vehicles off road. So Jeep people really do take their vehicles off road. I've been out there. I've seen them out there. Anyway, what they say is it's it's one of the cool things is save the the electric power for when you get off road. And I did that. Uh, there's some uh, pretty cool local trails around us. And I went out there and it was so neat to, you know, put the windows down, have it in pure electric assist and be just driving very slowly up this off road trail with almost no noise around me whatsoever. I mean, you can actually hear nature. You can hear the tires as they go over, uh, you know, rocks and roots and when they're, you know, looking for traction. And I was a little worried that. Uh, you know, what would the, you know, how would the throttle be, you know, it, you know, as sometimes EVs give you a lot of power at once, right? They can give you all the power at once, but I found the throttle uh, very easy to modulate and it was really just kind of a, a pretty neat off-road experience. And I also want to say before we go on that Jeep says, and it sure appeared as though it does have, has all of the off-road capability of any Wrangler. So you don't lose anything there. The only thing you really lose is you lose uh, some a little bit of uh, rear seat room when you're folding it down flat because of the battery pack that's back there. Right. Now, Ryan, that brings up an interesting point about, you know, battery packs and whatnot. And and it, when I we were talking about this vehicle, uh, my first thoughts was that we, we tested a RAV4 hybrid and then we tested a RAV4 Prime plug-in hybrid. And, and unanimously, we thought that the extra weight that we think is getting is coming with the RAV4 Prime actually improve the ride. Now, did you, did you find that to be also the case with the, uh, with the Wrangler four by E? So I, I didn't, I personally didn't find that, um, the, the Wrangler, this Wrangler rides like the Wranglers ride to me. Um, they're a little bouncy, they're off-road trucks. Um, you know, this was a Rubicon, so it has, um, you know, these more aggressive off-road tires. Uh, so there's more road noise there. Um, it's, but the ride was honestly, it felt like driving a normal Jeep it just has this battery, um, you know, assist when you want to, you know, when you want to, uh, like Monty said, like you, you save that battery to go off road and then you have the pure electric experience. Um, and then that little bit of space that you lose in the rear, otherwise it's a Wrangler, um, you know, and it, this was, this one was cool cause it was a Rubicon. So it had all the off road features, the locking differentials and the sway bar disconnects and stuff like that. Um, but as far as driving it, I mean, it drives, it's still, the steering's still a little loose. You got to pay attention to keep it on, on your, in your lane. And um, it's fun to drive. It bounces around. I mean, it probably get tired, you know, a little tiring on a long drive, which we've stated before with the Wranglers, um, you know, we've tested in the past, including the Gladiator. Um, but that, I think it's a good thing that they left it like that. It's fast too. I mean, oh, this thing coots. is yeah. really yeah. quick because you're combining a turbocharged four cylinder with electric assist. So to, uh, yeah, uh, like two lane passing zones are no problem for this thing. And I thought the automatic shifted nice and smoothly. The only thing that I really noticed was sometimes when I was coming to a stop, there was a little bit of uh, some lurchiness. I, I don't know if that was more from uh, the transmission downshifting, but but for the most part, I thought the the transitions back and forth were really good and just the, the level of power that this thing has, it's funny, it, you, like you don't really notice it till it's like, I noticed that final quarter when you're really flooring it, say to make a two lane passing zone. Oh my gosh, then you, it really comes on it. You don't really notice it till you really, and everything comes on and then it's kind of awesome. Yeah, I was going to I was going to add that same thing the, as a hybrid itself, just driving around. I was very impressed with it. I mean, it, the transitions, like you mentioned, back and forth from electric to the engine and, um, you know, the shifts, everything was quite um you know, refined feeling. It was nice. And um, I think, I mean, that's also a good thing, right? I, I, I think it's it's going to be interesting to see, um, you know, how this sticks, if people are, you know, get into this or not. Um, you know, I, I I don't know. So so that's, you know, that, that brings up a good point. And we're kind of like, you know, very gingerly dancing around this subject matter. <laughs> uh, and and that's that's some of the hardcore numbers here. Let's start with the price. So the 4 by e starts at around $50,000. A loaded Wrangler, similar to the one that we that we drove, it's easy to spend you know, 65,000, I'm sorry, let me say this again. $65,000 
for for a Wrangler, which which is just eye opening. Now listen, you, you, the sticker shock is tempered a little bit, uh, somewhat by the seventy five hundred dollar uh, federal tax credit that you may be able to qualify for. But still, that is a ton of money to to spend on a Wrangler, and I get the appeal. It is undoubtedly cool to drive this vehicle. It's not a sports car, but there is something about sitting up high, the flat windshield, every driver that sees you is doing, you know, the, mm, the peace sign and stuff like that, or the V for victory sign. That's an old, you know, Jeep thing. Um, but but another thing that, that struck me, and this was pointed out by my very smart and uh, car enthusiast, 21 year old son. He said, you know, dad, it's always going to be an interesting conversation. You know, dad. Um, so he said, you know, the, the, this this hybrid Wrangler, um, it, it only gets better fuel economy when it's running on its gas engine than the V8 Wrangler. So yeah, you can get that huge V8 stuffed in, in a Wrangler. So so I was like, okay, I'm going to do my due diligence here. I'm going to go to the EPA website, look this up. And uh, so the the 4xE, the hybrid, plug-in hybrid, gets 20 miles per gallon overall when it's running on gas. The six-cylinder turbo diesel gets 25 miles per gallon overall. The four-cylinder gas gets 22. The six-cylinder gas gets 21. And the V8 gets 14. So running on just gas, the hybrid model really doesn't do that well with fuel economy. And I, I wow. think, Quince, maybe that's not what the point of this vehicle is my guess. You know, first of all, Jeep says that over the next few years, every Jeep nameplate is going to become electrified. Now, electrified could be, you know, various ways, whether it's full, you know, full EV or a hybrid uh, or a mild hybrid, uh, they're not exactly saying. But uh, I think they're just trying to kind of test the waters in a sense, get people kind of used to this idea, kind of move in slowly. And with the with this uh, idea that, hey, try this other aspect of off-roading. You know, try this, try doing it in full EV mode. Uh, because you're right, as a, as a, when you think of it as a plug-in hybrid, it's it's not that efficient. And you know all these other things you sort of said were were not only gingerly about the efficiency, but everything else that is not good about the Wrangler is still there. I mean, <laughs> the, right? Uh, the, like the, the window the, the, switches, <laughs> the window switches that are over here, you know, in the middle that are hard to reach quickly. Now I know as an owner you're going to get used to that, but it's still. You're used to window switches right here for a reason because they're really easy to get to. Someone's coming over, you want to put your window down, and instead of having to fumble for it, there's no dead pedal in this thing or left foot rest, as people call it, and which is uncomfortable on trips. Uh, you know, I don't like this pull strap, uh, this weird pull strap seat back adjuster. Uh, as Ryan talked about, the handling is still terrible. It's very loud inside. On the highway, there is just wind noise all over the place. Um, and the ride is still bouncy, obviously. I mean, maybe it, it helps it a little bit. But again, it's hard for us to compare exactly because we don't buy a Rang uh, we don't buy a Rubicon. This is a Rubicon, so it's got different tires. But uh, the things that are not great about the Jeep and Quince, you talked about the sixty four thousand dollars. This thing is just full of hard plastic materials in there. It does not. If you're used to a sixty four thousand dollar SUV, this is going to be a shock. And you know what I mean? And you can't just say, well, Jeeps are only for Jeep people. Well, I don't know. But but the interior is not, let's just, let's just say it's not up to $64,000 But I don't think Jeep, levels. I don't think Jeep people are used to a $64,000 Well, that Jeep, might be true. You know, like that's that's a lot of money. I mean, that's, whew. Well, I mean, it, I don't know if we're ever going to get to this point where, you know, a, a, a fuel efficient hybrid Wrangler is going to have no price penalty because, because like with, with a lot of Toyotas, the hybrid or the regular model is about the same price, and and right. it, it's it's just a it's it's a it's a I know they're gonna they're gonna sell these probably pretty well at least initially. Who knows? You know, let's 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 revisit the sales numbers in about a year when the kind of the the newness is worn off. But 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 sixty five thousand is is a is a is a big is a big note to handle. Yeah, I, I thought it was also interesting that. They're not making a huge deal out of the four by e ness of on the outside of the vehicle. You know, it's got the blue trim signifies there's some like blue trim around some of the um yeah the, the tow letter hook, the tow hooks and stuff like that. Yeah. Right, there's some blue trim that in, in, uh, signifies that it's the four by e and it's got a four by e on the back of the vehicle. But they didn't make a big deal out of it, and I'm I'm curious. So because I was as I was driving around, I was trying to figure out if people you know again like you said. If you're in a if you're in a Wrangler, everyone in a Wrangler waves to you. 
it's kind of actually interesting. But I also uh, was wondering if someone was going to stop me and say, "Oh, hey, is that the new four by E?" And no one, <laughs> no one actually noticed. So because yeah. it is very, it, but it is very subtle, and maybe that's yeah. intentional by Jeep. They don't want to. They don't want people to think. You know, some in a way, hybrids have kind of this weird um kind of geekiness to them I, maybe that's not the right term and maybe jeep doesn't want to like hey you know we're not this is still a rough and tough uh jeep wrangler uh this is not your you know if you think of a toyota prius as the, the hybrid of all hybrids this is the exact opposite of, of a prius in that sense you know it's still very yeah. very tough Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, I think, you know, it, th- this this vehicle uh, definitely get a th- gets a thumbs up from the three of us. Uh, uh, check out ConsumerReports.org for, you know, more impressions on the Wrangler. And uh, <clears throat> we're really, really happy that we, we get to try this 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 Rubicon model, which is, like I said, undeniably cool. So before we move on, we want to take a moment to let you know about the Talking Cars donation program. If you're not aware Consumer Reports is a nonprofit organization, so all the work we do is funded by memberships as well as donations. If you're able to give, it really does help keep us doing the work that we're doing, including this show. You can find more information at cr.org slash give talking cars. So as we're you know, wrapping up talking about the Wrangler 4 by e that got us thinking about other SUVs and what kind of classics they may or may not make in the future. We've had other questions at Talking Cars about asking the panelists what we thought were, might be future classics, and we came up with a bunch. Of, I think this is always an interesting topic, and it, 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 it came, this, this discussion of whether or not SUVs are going to be you know, classic cars or collectible cars uh, in the future was brought up. Uh, by uh, a gentleman named Ezekwe from Atlanta. And, and he wrote us a question. He said, he said I've, I've seen quite a few lists recently about cars that are soon to be highly sought after classics, but they never seem to include SUVs. I'm wondering what Talking Cars thinks the classic SUVs will be and where where the crossovers fit into that conversation. So, you know, Ryan and Mike and I, we, we all like old cars. We like new cars. We like all kinds of stuff. Uh, Ryan, Mike and I have all spent time uh, getting taking trucks and SUVs in the dirt. Um, so we definitely have some some strong feelings about SUVs. So, so Ryan, if you were going to pick a, 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 an SUV, a crossover that you think might be a classic in the future, let us have it. So, yeah, this is an uh, interesting question. And, you know, he's right. But I also think that there's actually there's there are these classic SUVs out there. And, um, you know, for instance, the, the, the Land Rover uh, Defender 90, a dream truck of mine. Um, it was always a European, you know, all over the world, except for the U.S. vehicle. And then in like 94, we got the North American spec Defender for like three years, four years. And um, one of those today is like eighty thousand dollars. You know, and it could be falling apart. I mean, the the, the money these things are, you know, get capturing is ridiculous. Um, you know, a, a lot of these, a lot of other vehicles are th- like that. I mean, the 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 G uh, Mercedes G wagon, another one. I mean, that's timeless, and it's it's still outrageous to buy new, and it's still outrageous to buy used. Um, but I think that for for me, the one that is kind of a sleeper, and it's, it it is gaining some value, is just the the early '90s, uh, late '80s uh, Toyota Land Cruiser. I think the body style was a J80. I think they called it. Um, now he mentions crossovers. <clears throat> that's going to take some time. I don't know that that's such a murky mixed thing that there's so many of them um you know a lot of these the vehicles i think of are more distinguished you know they're big uh, trucks or they have some off-road abilities to them that make them unique um so the land cruisers would be my pick uh really good ones and you might hear another one of those in the near future from me um anyway <laughs> um uh, mike what's your pick yeah so i totally get Ezekwe's point about most lists when you talk about classic vehicles you do you know it does seem like it's a lot of like you know 60s and 70s muscle cars right uh classic ferraris and lamborghinis that that you know uh, are able to garner huge prices at auctions and things like that so i i get i get that you know question about you know why is it always cars and not suvs but i do think there will be some suvs as ryan said down the road that will be classic and and one of them that i think uh down the road uh, will be, and maybe to some extent already is, is the Jeep Grand Cherokee SRT8, uh, which came out in 2006. And this was a highly modified version of the Grand Cherokee that back then had uh, a 420 horsepower V8 
uh, stiffer suspension, handled really, for an SUV, it handled really well for that time. They actually still make it now. It's Now it's up to 475 horsepower, and it's a naturally aspirated V8. It sounds awesome. The ride is pretty stiff. It's not for everybody. I don't know if you remember back when it came out, you know, it had this dual central exhaust system. They In the center, had, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. they had to build yeah. a special... Um, uh, hitch for it so you could tow vehicles because normally it's that, that exhaust system was in the way. <laughs> yeah, um, you don't want it. <laughs> and I, I think that yeah. one, uh, aside from the fact that, you know, Jeep has had, uh, the Grand Cherokee has had some reliability issues over the years. But, uh, you know, if you can find one that's pretty low miles down the road, I, and I think down the road, you're not going to find, there aren't going to be vehicles like this down the road. And also, if you're really feeling spicy, you could go for the Grand Cherokee. Uh, Trackhawk, which has a 707 horsepower supercharged V8, but the price is a little, uh, you know, a uh, little, you know, a little out there and it's a little bit ridiculous as well. I mean, it's just <laughs> over the top. So for me, yeah. I would say Grand Cherokee SRT8 down the road could be a really classic SUV. If you have one now, I'd say hold on to it. Yeah. That's a good pick, Mikey. Thanks. You know, it, it, anything worth doing is worth doing to excess. And, and exactly. as, you, as, as you're describing, like the the the, the Grand Cherokee SRT, uh, my first thought was, was like, "Hey, hey, Ryan, how are those tires going to be in the winter? Huh? <laughs> Not good." <laughs> Yeah. So a previous podcast, uh, we talked about future collectibles, and I mentioned the 2007 to 2014 Toyota FJ Cruiser. I still think that's going to be a future collectible. I've I've seen these in on on Auto Trader, uh, you know, models that have lots and lots of miles, as is Toyota's reputation, still going for you know thirty forty thousand dollars. But uh, I I also thought like with Ryan, I'm going to amp it up a notch. I'm going to say you've got neighbor that have Wranglers and you want something like that. So by all means, Def Land Rover Defender 90, you know, these are, these are big money. They're super cool, convertible, hard top. You don't see them coming and going like you do a lot of models like the Wranglers. Uh, so so that's that's my pick. And I just had the sinking feeling that one of you guys is going to do the Defender. And well, there you have it. I, you know, I'm, I'm omniscient, I think. I don't know. Uh, anyway, um, that, that's a great question. We love talking about classics. By all means, please tell us uh, what classic SUVs you think are going to be worth uh, something in the future. Uh, all your questions, we love getting them. Talking cars at iCloud.com. Uh, send us a, a text questions, video questions. Keep coming. They're awesome. And we're going to keep this train rolling with a video question. This is Jerry from Oakland, California. Hello, Talking Cars. I have a 2014 Subaru Impreza with a standard transmission, which I recently had repainted. And that set me to thinking about washing my car. I saw a, an expert on the YouTube channel who suggested that I should be using waterless car wash. And I couldn't find anything on CR that suggested that soap was doing any harm. Uh, so I was in a quandary. I know that the soap and water that I use goes down into the street and into the drain and eventually gets into San Francisco Bay. And that concerns me. So I'm really trying to decide here, should I stick with my waterless car wash, which is a little bit more trouble, or am I free to go back to soap and water? So in our podcast pre-production meeting, we found out that Mr. Monticello used to detail cars. So we thought, well, aren't you uniquely qualified to, to answer this question? What do you got for Jerry, Mike? Yeah, so we haven't, uh, you know, Consumer Reports hasn't done much testing on these, you know, waterless uh, kind of ways of, of washing your car, which is basically it's, it's you know, it's some spray material that uh, you're, you would spray the car with it and you'd wipe it down. The thing is, is that it's not it's not going to be for everyone because there are times when you're going to need to uh, hose off your car because maybe it's got, you know, it's got uh, grease and, you know, rubber and road grime that's really gunked up on the car and you don't want to, the, the problem with these things, if you just start spraying stuff on and start scrubbing it, you could be, uh, you know, rubbing that, you know, uh, dirt, you know, onto the paint and, and potentially scratching it. So I think that they work if you have uh, a light amount of dirt, you know, if you're someone who, who cleans your car, wipes it down on a, on a regular basis, this is something that could work for you. But if you don't, clean it very often, uh, 
this is going to be a it's going to be a lot of work to do this i get the point of saving water 100 percent get that but it's going to be a lot of work to try and clean a, a really dirty car with this i just don't think it's the way to go i think you want to go old school with the hose uh and i i love washing my, my car my well my tacoma my truck myself uh and just getting in there with you know a mitt uh sponge uh kind of thing and and just um really giving it a good clean. I will say that I do use these types of, you know, waterless, uh, you know, car washing materials on my motorcycles, but it's a different story for the motorcycle because I have a much smaller surface area. I mean, I don't do it with my dirt bikes because they get way too dirty and they need to be hosed off. But on my street bikes, yeah, I spray this stuff on. It's basically like a car detailer and I and I wipe it down. And I think it can work for a situation where you're more, I'm almost kind of like more dusting the car than, than anything else, you know, because my motorcycles typically don't get that dirty because I don't ride them every day. Uh, when I want to clean them up before or after a ride, I can use some of the spray stuff and it's, and it's pretty quick. You don't have the whole deal where, you know, you have to get out the hose and the bucket and, and everything like that. So, um, yeah. Uh, thanks very much for your question, Jerry, and very nice editing job on your video. Which moves us on to our next question. Uh, this one is from Ajo from Yonkers, New York. And Yonkers, New York, the home headquarters of Consumer Reports. Check it out. Uh, okay, so what do we have here? So uh, Ajo writes, my dad recently got his tires replaced at a local chain tire shop. When he got home, I noticed they were asymmetrical tires and all mounted incorrectly with the inside wall on the outside. I realized that as a non-car person, he may never have noticed unless I pointed it out, as the tires have the exact same markings on both sides, with just a tiny stamp to designate which was inside and outside. This got me thinking. Why don't they just make the inside part of the tire blank with no markings at all? So mistakes like this could be more obvious. It might even save them money in manufacturing and warranty claims for low tread life, in addition to safety concerns. Well, I have to say that uh, you probably should be playing the lottery because Ryan Pislikowski is one of our resident tire experts, and he is here to help you out. Ryan, take it away. Yeah, um, this is this has happened um before, right? I mean, I, I mount I, since in the 16 years I've been working at Consumer Reports. I have mounted and dismounted, um, let's say, thousands of tires, right? And among them are asymmetric tires. And I have mounted a tire. Um, you know, luckily I caught myself before you know going with all four of them, but um, you know, mounted it uh, backwards. Asymmetric meaning you know the tread is designed a certain way where they want you know a a, portion, the, a a certain side of the tire facing out and a certain side facing in. And it has to be mounted that way, and that's that. There are also, um, you know, symmetric tires or unidirectional tires that have a tread pattern that doesn't matter. The tire can be mounted inside, outside. It can be anywhere on the vehicle. And then there are directional tires, which have a directional, as it states, tread pattern. So they'll have like maybe those Chevron Vs or, um, you know, that directional pattern. Um, when they're making these tires, there are laws that tire manufacturers have to ab abide by. They have, there are certain um, labels that need to be on the tire on both sides, um, on one side at least. Um, but when they're building a tire, there's, you know, these molds are super expensive in the first place. Um, so when they're, you know, they have to put something on both sides, no matter what. Why not put your name on there? It's some, um, you know, marketing. They, you know, they're very proud of their products. Get that, get it out there. Make it uh, pretty. You know, um, there are tire manufacturers that do make an inside sidewall look as different as they can from the um, outside. Um, but I, I get it. I've, t I've I've mounted some that literally there's just this tiny little thing that says inside or outside, or or sometimes it only says inside. It doesn't even say outside. You just you know you have to flip it over um, and really pay attention. But um, at the end of the day, you have to pay attention when you're mounting these. Hopefully, the professionals that you're having do it, um, you know, can catch that. Or you should pay attention too, as they, you know, the car comes out of the shop. Make sure they are on there correctly. The, he should definitely go back and have them swapped. That's not on him. That's on the, uh, you know, the tire shop. Obviously, he didn't take it home and screw them up himself. He doesn't have the equipment to do so. So, um, it's a good, it's a good question. Excellent. I love getting tire questions, and and it honestly is one that I hadn't thought about. Uh, one of the things I just love about the, the Talking Cars audience is they come up with the greatest, greatest questions. This one also was, was really spot on. So next we have a question from Sam. On episode number 308, Alex said that he uses his transmission to break down mountains using paddle shifters. I was always taught by mechanics to use the brakes as they are cheaper to replace than the wear and tear on a transmission. 
has his vice changed these days? So yes, um, Sam, uh, I too have been told the same thing about you know brakes uh, versus transmission. But it got us to thinking. Well, you know, is is that advice still going? So so Mike, what do you have for Sam? So uh, I was brought up uh, to you know always you know I learned to drive on a manual transmission car. Uh, we, that's all we had, and um, you know. Both my dad and my mom always uh, downshifted on downhills to uh, use the engine braking, and that's what my dad taught me to do. Um, and the 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 reality is that there isn't there's you know no significant wear and tear from uh, using engine braking you know uh, on a downhill. And um, I did check with Big John, our mechanic, just to make sure that that is the case. Um, and I also talked to Jake Fisher, you know, who's the director of auto testing. He said another thing that you, when you can downshift and, and keep in mind, I don't know if people were, when you said Alex, you meant Alec Nizek, Alex Nizek, who was, you know, one of the guys on our, on our podcast, um, is that, uh, when you're using the engine braking, you're keeping the car kind of more in control in a sense. So not only are you able, you can control the speed on a downhill. It's also nice because you're not annoying people behind you by putting your brakes on and off. I, I personally don't like that. Uh, and also if you're in like snow or something like that, you, you know, it's, it's more of a chance of locking up, uh, the tires skidding because using the brakes rather than if you can control some speed with the engine braking. So there are reasons that, so, but you know, big John said, totally agree with all that. But he said when, and you know, there's no issues, uh, with an automatic or paddle shift car, as far as using the engine braking and downshifting, but he said with a manual transmission, he said, it's not a good idea to be downshifting as you're coming to a stop. He said, in that instance, you actually just want to put the car in neutral and just use the brakes. He said, um, that saves wear on the clutch. He said, if you're leaving the clutch pedal engaged, uh, when you're coming to a stop, you're, uh, it keeps pressure on the throwout bearing that on the throwout bearing that isn't necessary. The downside there is, uh, you don't, now you're not getting the cool heel and toe blipping <laughs> downshifting as you're coming to the stop, which you got to do if you're driving a manual. So Big John uh, is kind of bumming me out because I've always downshifted. Uh, that was part of how, you know, when you're learning how to heel and toe downshifting, which if you don't know, folks, you should look it up. But basically it's it's you've got one part of your foot is on the brake, part of your foot is on the gas pedal, and you're blipping to smooth out the downshifts as you're going through the gears. Um you're matching revs. You're matching revs. And part of trying to learn how to do that when you're 16 is you're trying to do it anytime you can. That means coming to a stop or when you're just downshifting for a turn. And so Big John kind of is bumming me out because now I found out I really should just put in the thing and put it, put it in the neutral. But that's why we, we tune in for the podcast. Hopefully you folks learn something new every week. And lately I've been learning something new every week. Uh, great question. So we're going to wrap this up with a question from Scott from Ames, Iowa. I've noticed that 2012 and 2013 Nissan Leaf pricing is hovering around the $5,000 to $8,000 range. And I have a 16-year-old daughter who's been following EV news and would love to drive and take care of one. Her daily driving is about 10 miles in total. In a few years, when she heads off to college, we would then have the battery replaced for about $5,000, which would give new life and significantly more range to the car when she would need it most. What am I missing? Are there better options to consider? So, Scott, I uh, looked into this, and uh, like you, I have young drivers in my household. Uh, but in terms of getting an older Nissan Leaf, a, a few red flags immediately popped out at me. Uh, one of, of the models that we've tested, our, our first Leaf range was around 75 miles, which increased to about 140 in later models. Our, our 2019 Leaf test car, it was the Leaf Plus, and that had a 62 kilowatt battery and had a range of about 215 miles. So it, it takes about eight hours to charge it on a 240 volt connector. And if you're, you know, young teenage drivers are anything like mine, they don't plan ahead for nothing. So, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I can see like my kids like, I got to go somewhere, but my car isn't charged up. How did that happen? Uh, so anyway, that, that's one thing to consider. Uh, another thing is um, 
you know, so even even the best leaf that we tested is that the the range is still shorter than our our the last Chevrolet Bolt that we tested, which gets two hundred fifty miles for a range. Uh, but but to me, one of the biggest uh, red flags is that the leaf scored a poor in the IHS small overlap crash test for the twenty thirteen to twenty seventeen models. And and as we always say at Consumer Reports, you want to give your young drivers as much safety advantage as possible because they're inexperienced. They really don't know what they're doing. So you can, an argument can be made. If, you, if you're still stuck on the LEAF, um, you need to check out the later versions. The 2020 automatic emergency braking with pedestrian detection, lane departure warning, blind spot warning, and automatic high beams became standard. So in terms of getting a, a young driver in your household into a car, while I appreciate her enthusiasm for electric vehicles, uh, I don't think that that model leaf would be a, a way to go. But I'm just one opinion, one dad's opinion. But I'm going to throw it to Ryan. Uh, Ryan, what do you have to say for Scott? Yeah, well, my opinion is such uh, as yours. I, I don't think this is a – there's too many red flags here for me. Um, you know, the leaf in general um, wasn't the nicest – uh, especially the early one wasn't the nicest car to drive. Um, and the, the range, I know they're not really overly concerned about the range, but you might, until you actually own one, I think that doesn't recover reality. Um, you know, you, like you say, you forget to charge it or something and you, you know, and then you get range anxiety and I don't know, the whole thing gets crazy. But, um, unfortunately there's not a lot of options. Um, and you know, at that price range for an, an EV, I um, mean, obviously if you went newer, you're going to spend more money. Um, I would, if you're, you know, trying to be conscientious of, um, you know, your your carbon footprint and whatnot, um, an earlier Prius um, hybrid, it's just a hybrid, but um, they're bulletproof. Um, they're they're fairly practical cars, um, and you don't have to worry. You don't have you won't have range anxiety. You won't have, um, you know, to worry about those the, the charging and whatnot. Um, my, my recommendation would be a, um, a Prius. I don't mean to rain on her parade. Um, I appreciate the enthusiasm as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike. Uh, so I think uh, I say go for the used leaf. I mean, you, it's hard to beat those prices. Those prices are ridiculous. Now you could you could say, well, maybe it's for a reason, and maybe it is. Um, but and also, you may not even need to spend this five thousand dollars or whatever on this battery because yes, although EV batteries will lose some range over time, just like you know cell phone batteries, right? Same thing. Uh, but you know, wait and see how how the range is before you you know. Uh, you go and, and buy a new battery pack. You may you may not need that or may not need that for a while. Um, keep in mind, the 2012 and 2013 Leaf is a CR recommended used car purchase. You know, the the um, the reliability was much above average for uh, the Leaf during those years. And most of the years, the reliability for the Leaf has been really good. So I think that um, I, I think it it could be a very inexpensive way to go. Uh, as long as she can figure out, you know, a way to charge it, you know, at college, I think it should it should be fine. The other the other thing is how far away is college from home? Because if college is more than say seventy miles away from home, well, I don't know about her, but I'm not going to want to stop and have to charge uh, to to get home with that leaf. Because with the leaf, you're going to have to stop a lot to charge because its range, especially those early ones, the range is so low. Definitely with with uh, with Ryan with the Prius on this one, but hey, follow up with us. Uh, let us know what you what you you know finally get for your daughter because we're real interested to see how that goes. Well, that's gonna about do it for this episode. As always, check the show notes for more information about the vehicles and topics as we discussed. Just a reminder: keep your questions coming to talkingcars at iCloud.com. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next week. <music>